I'm Adolfo Shabadu Quinones, um, probably known for, uh, most known for the film Breaking and Breaking 2 Electric Boogaloo. I got my start uh, in the 1970s, dancing on the show called Soul Train, and eventually becoming one of the original founding members of The Lockers. And I'm here right now on Buzz TV. <laughs> As a young kid growing up in, on the streets of Chicago, grew up in the Karina Green Project homes and then the greater north side of Chicago. And uh, dancing was a, a way of escaping my surroundings. Uh, I didn't have a, 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 a great childhood growing up. I had a great mom, but I didn't have a great childhood. It was uh, very dangerous in the neighborhoods I lived in. So I, always, I was always afraid. And so dancing was a way to escape that, that environment. Uh, well, the Lockers, we weren't formed on Soul Train, although we, were, we did have a kind of loose, loose relationship. Um, my friend, my close friend was Campbell Lock Jr. And I, well, you could say I was, I was his protege. And uh, then you have uh, Fluky Luke. They, he was also a friend and uh, Scooby-Doo at the time. Uh, Scooby-Doo and Campbell Lock Jr. were, were roommates on 39th and Budlong. And so we used to practice in their living room. So everything that we practiced, we would go out to the clubs and see how it worked out. And then we would eventually work it out in the clubs. And then you would see it on national television on Soul Train. Uh, but no, we didn't have a dance crew. Or the Lockers was basically my first dance crew family. We didn't even call them dance crews. There was no such vernacular. We called ourselves a dance troupe. And the name The Lockers the formation of the lockers, the formal formation was uh, by Tony Basil. Uh, some people think it was Don Campbell, but it wasn't. Uh, of course, Tony Basil formed the group with Don Campbell's blessing, but it was really Tony that, that brought the group together and fashioned us into a professional team. And if you know Tony Basil's uh, past, I mean, she, she grew up in a showbiz family. She has an amazing story. Uh, that, that she, uh, I'm sure, will share with you soon. And, um, but it was Tony. Tony formed the Lockers, and I was basically the last member selected. And I was selected because Tony Basil's uh, boyfriend, as she's told me, uh, Dean Stockwell, the, the actor Dean Stockwell, he uh, said, hey, Tony, you, you should really get Shabadu. He's a movie star, <laughs> whatever that meant. But in any case, she liked my persona. I had, I had a kind of ladies' man persona in those days. And um, I was able to mimic a lot of different dance styles. And that became kind of a, a trademark for me. My earlier name was Sir Lancelot, and later known as Shabadu. And I was kind of referred to as the mimic because I could copy different dance styles very quickly. Uh, and the way, here's my secret. So if you're listening out there, the secret to, to copying a dance style is not the moves. You have to study the person. In the person, uh, you can see, you can catch their idiosyncrasies. In those idiosyncrasies, you will see their dance style. Like Campbell Lock Jr. tended to hun hunch his back a lot. He tended to bend his, his knees lower than normal when he walked. Uh, he had a kind of... Uh, a kind of uh, a jungle gate to the way he walked. <laughs> like he was walking through a jungle, you know. And uh, I used to watch him in the clubs and I said, there you go. That's how you dance too, huh? You dance like you're, you're, you're wild and in the jungle. And so I just kind of focused on that. And I was able to mimic him uh, right away. And then I, I also with Fluky Luke, there was a kind of eccentric way that he he carried himself. He was very, very energetic, uh, borderline crazy, <laughs> but in a fun way, you know. And uh, But in there, in his personality, his locking style emerged, and I was able to catch that, too. So again, if you want to learn a dance style, don't focus on the dances first. Focus on 
the way that the person is dancing that you like and check out their personality, how they speak, how they walk, how they talk, and in there is the dance style. Dancing on Soul Train, being a young black man growing up in the, in the 1960s and, and being able to go on a show like Soul Train that, that gave us a platform that, that showed people our beauty and our beauty and movement and our attitudes and all of that stuff. It was an incredibly magical time in America. So Dancing on Soul Train was a great stepping stone for the next level. And the next level was the formation of the lockers that you realize that this is how you do things. This is how you bring a street element to the stages across America. I mean, we were opening for Frank Sinatra, uh, Dean Martin, uh, John Davison, um, Bill Cosby, you name it. We were doing the talk show circuits, we had specials. We even had our own special called Saturday Celebration. So then we were on the first season of Saturday Night Live. We were the act. We actually appeared on there, I think, two or three times. Yeah? It's me. Oh, the door is open. How you doing? I'm all right. We sure turned the place up last night, didn't we? Yeah, we did okay. <laughs> James thinks we really have something. He says that we have one of the hottest acts around. Oh, did he now? Yeah, that's why I dropped by. He told me about this big dance contest, and there's going to be judges from all over the country there. It's really big. Are you kidding? Those dudes don't want to have nothing to do with our kind. Oh, what do you mean? We're good. That's all that counts. Oh, yeah? Well, you know what I think? I think we'll be wasting our time. Those dudes don't want to give us the chance. Actually, he's working on it right now. He's got some really great connections. And he can get us the chance. Uh, doing the film's break-in was a natural, again, a natural progression. Uh, you know, starting off uh, with the, on Soul Train and then the lockers. And from the lockers, I went solo in 1977. So I was primed for what will eventually be the break-in film. I did a film a documentary called Breaking and Entering, which I proposed to Topper Carew at Rainbow Productions. And it became the definitive West Coast documentary for street dance uh, in Los Angeles and the West Coast period. And that film was the blueprint for the Breaking films. So by this time I had now choreographed Lionel Richie's All Night Long video, appeared in that, in that video. I also went on to do his tour, and from his tour I was cast in, as, the, uh, as Ozone, but I, originally I wasn't supposed to be Ozone. I was supposed to choreograph the film. Uh, I met with Menachem Golan, and he was like, okay, you gotta imagine, when I showed up there, I showed up just like I looked in the movie. I had the hat, the earring, the earring I made. Here's another bit of history trivia. I made the earring. I made the earring uh, from a few different uh, pieces of jewelry. One was an ivory tusk, uh, another one was a, 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 a what was called an ear cuff and a necklace. So I took a chain from the necklace, attached the, the tusk to it, then I attached that to the cuff and I clipped that to my ear. Uh, so that became my signature uh, piece of uh, my attire, you know. So in any case, I'm with uh, Menachem Golden and Menachem Golden in the meeting says, hey, Shabadu, uh, can you act? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I can act. I'm from Chicago. Something like that. I don't even know what I, I think I might, might have just blurted out, I'm from Chicago. And he said, okay, Shabadu from Chicago. Go over to Basker and Champion. So I go to Basker and Champion who were casting the film. And I, um, I auditioned. I didn't know anything about acting. I certainly had a lot of performance under my belt, but I wasn't an actor. So I said, you know, I'm not an actor. I'll just play myself. You know, I'll just be myself. So I'm, I'm there. And in those days, I smoked cigarettes. So I was smoking a cigarette. And again, with the fedora, the earring, the, you know, the, the crop top, which we used to wear as one of the lockers and, and in the lockers. And 
at foxtails and, and the bandanas, by the way, which I started, the bandanas around my waist and around my ankles was to, the ones around my ankles were supposed to be spats because I like Cap Calloway with the zoot suit and the pants that I, I wore in the breaking uh, films. Uh, those pants were zoot suit pants. I actually got them tailor-made over here in Boyle Heights. Uh, so it was a great little Mexican tailor that made all my clothes in those days. But he ma anyway, he made the, the zoot suit pants. And uh, he also uh, made other articles that I, I wore in the film. And some of the, the clothes I purchased in Japan while I was on tour with Lionel, uh, we, we, uh, I went to a, a shop, I think, in Harajuku or Roppongi. And punk rock clothes I was wearing. So was Boogaloo Shrimp. So I wore those clothes. And... Uh, I'm standing there, if you could imagine, just like I did, just like I look in a movie, nothing changed. I was just smoking a cigarette and looking around. Going. <laughs> the casting lady says, hey, hey you, you can start now. <laughs> that was like, oh, yeah, okay. You know, I thought, you know, I, I thought it had started. I, I didn't know if there was a, what the procedure was or anything, because again, I wasn't a professional actor. I was just a street dancer that knew my own personality and my own persona. So I was just playing my persona. So, um, she's, so she just read a line off the page. She says, who's next? And I said, Ozone, street dancer. Who's next? Ozone. Street dancer. And when I said that, the room got quiet. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I guess they don't like me. I don't know. You know. That was going on in my head. So I said, I don't care. I went and I got in my car. I drove off. And I was like, I don't care. I just want to choreograph the movie. But I got, you know, just a few blocks away or so. And my agent called. And he goes, and I go, I know, I know. Because I thought, you know, and I had a cell phone then. Um, I had, but it looked like the size of a microwave. It, it, was so, it was like a huge cell phone, one of those Motorola's. I had one of those. And um, so I was like, huh? <laughs> what? Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, and he says, hey, they like you. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. They want to see you for Ozone. And your little friend that's in your, in your troupe? He said, yeah. He goes, they want to see you with him, too. And I said, Boogaloo Shrimp? And he was like, yeah. I said, okay, so now, if you know the history, Boogaloo Shrimp and I had this sort of shtick, right? And he was able to go out on tour. We were doing tours because his mom was Jehovah's Witness, and my mom was Jehovah's Witness. So his mom trusted me to bring shrimp, you know, across the country or what have you, so we could tour. So um, we, we developed this rapport, and it was sort of like Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, so here we are on the set now. Do, I'm doing what is called, I didn't know what it was called then, but now I know it's called a callback. <laughs> so we get a callback. And um, so it's Shrimp and I uh, standing there now, right? And uh, so we just started doing what we do, you know, like our little shtick. So Shrimp was like, hey, Chopper dude, uh, uh, hey, you wanna go get them? Wanna go get those? Wanna go get those guys? We, we should cut them. We should cut them. And I was like, hey, be cool, be cool, you know. I was playing the cool guy, remember? I'm Dean Martin, so I was like, be cool. We'll get them. If they cross that line, we'll get them. You know, I was just talking like this, and uh, Shrimp was like going, oh, yeah. <laughs> so at one point, he jumps into my arms, and I'm carrying him. <laughs> and he's going, oh, oh, Shabadu, oh, what? You? And, you know, and they're laughing. They're going, you guys. But what we did was we brought a, a, a humor element that they weren't expecting. It was like, these guys could be serious, and they could be funny, too. Wow. And they can dance, and they're the real thing. We got something here. I mean, when we left there, we knew the room was crackling. We knew we had it because you, it, it wasn't even like you have to even think or, or try to make a movie. You just turn the camera on, and, and we're going to do our thing, you know? Whether it be dancing or whatever, we didn't need any choreography, really. All you need to do is just put on the record. We're going to dance, you know. So once, you know, make a long story short, history was made that day uh, with Breaking Films. And uh, Boogaloo and Shrimp and I uh, branded uh, a certain style 
that comes from L.A. That's what makes us different than Beat Street and Fast Forward and, and, and Body Rock and all those films that were out when, when our film came out. Um, we, were, we were different. I mean, all those guys were, you know, nylon sweatsuits or what have you, but we were very colorful and our clothes uh, was very different. Uh, our personalities were very different. And one thing that I have to take my hat off to Menachem Golden, rest in peace. Menachem Golden now passed away, but he knew that the film had to be about real street dancers, that it had to be real street dancers in, the, in those roles. And my natural role that I was playing in real life was I was the leader of, of the dancers in L.A. I did have the most fame and the credibility in those days. I mean, I had already been on Soul Train, already one of the original Soul Train gang, already one of the lockers, already on Broadway, already doing television shows and my own television series, all of these things, even before I even did break in. So it was, it was uh, I think, something that needed to happen, and I'm glad that it did, and had a great cast to work with. It was wonderful working with Lucinda Dickey and Boogaloo Shrimp and all the wonderful dancers that were a part of the movie. <laughs> I'm not going to stand for this. You must stop immediately. Now, did you hear, young man? Did you hear me? You must leave now. Look, I'm not going to stand for this. You must stop. Stop right this minute. We are auditioning jazz dancers only. Stop this nonsense. Jim. Oh. God, there's more of Jim! Jim, get them out of here this instant! Wait! I think, I, think uh, I would think that my persona and where I'm at in terms of my legacy would be much like the way Michael Corleone was in The Godfather. In those days, I was the Mark, I am still the Michael Corleone of the street dance movement. I didn't plan it that way, but it turned out that way. In hindsight, I can look at what I did and what chances I took that other people weren't willing to take. What matters to me and I say it again, is how I feel and my ability to express myself and given the opportunity to do so. Other than that, I, I, I didn't even care if I win or lose. I don't focus on things like that. You know, am I gonna win this role? Am I gonna get that thing? I don't think like that. I just say, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna show them who I am, how I feel about something. I'm not, I, don't, I don't even think, oh, I'm gonna kick my leg or I'm gonna show them how I, how I do my arms or I'm gonna do this. I don't, I don't even consider that. As a matter of fact, when I do perform and I do express myself, I forget about what I did because I was so, I'm so busy doing what I do. I have no time to re self-record what I'm doing. I just have time enough to, to tell the people how I feel, show them how I feel about something and usually uh, uh, how I feel in terms of how I feel as a, as a person, as, as, a, as a black man growing up, that's my secret. That's really my secret too. I, you know, when I go out and I dance, I don't dance I, for myself, I'm dancing for my people. I'm dancing for my black people, I'm dancing for my community, and I'm dancing for all the Africans that were brought here against their will. And when I step on the floor, I got 10,000 Zulus with me. You don't see me dancing by myself. You see the legacy of everyone before me. That's why I was able to do what most people were not able to do and was willing to do what most people are not willing to do, is spin themselves. I tell you, man, there is a, uh, a movie, Gattaca, and in that movie, Gattaca, he told his brother, in a society where they chose people based on their genetics, and he thought that his brother was greater than him, but he would always lose the swimming 
test or, 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 or a, a game they would play. They would swim out from the shore as far as they could. And inevitably, the younger brother would have to save the older brother who was perfect and he was imperfect. And at the end of the movie, it was revealed. He says, how did you beat me? You must tell me, how did you beat me? And, and the younger brother, I think it was Ethan Hawke, Ethan Hawke says to him, when I swim out, I save nothing for the return. I give everything I have to win, to go as far as I can. So I kind of feel like that same way. If you want, if you want success and you want to express yourself, you can't be saving anything for later. Put it all on the table right now. And that's what that's the those that's the thing that I was willing to do that most people are not willing to do. Spend it all. No. There, there is no Shabadu era parent. There's some that have come close. Some that wish to be. But again, they're not willing to do what's necessary to succeed. And I'm not talking about doing something dirty or being crooked or lying or cheating. That's not what I'm talking about. Now, here's an example. When I'm, when I, as I was coming up, lots of people challenged me. Oh, you know, Shabadu, you know, I can, I can dance better than you, man. You know, I, I can kick higher than you. I could pop better than you. I could do this better than you. All, all this stuff, always better than me. And I would look at them and say, you know, you may be able to do all those things better than me, but I feel more than you. See, and that, most people are not willing to go to that deep end of the pool to lay your heart on the table, give it everything you got. I mean, like, in that moment, I feel insane. I'm not normal. All that pain and suffering and all those things, they surface in me. And the, and the music ignites it. It's like a match. It just strikes a match and it sets me on fire. And, and at that point, I'm a, I'm a raving maniac. I'm not even in my right mind. You're not, you're not talking to a normal person at that point. So most people are not willing to go to that kind of psychological level or commit to that emotional level. And so if you want to be Shabadu, then you are already lost. Because Shabadu already did Shabadu. But if you want to be Marvin or Joseph or uh, Harry or whatever, that, that field is open. But I tell you right now, if you're willing to go to it and achieve the things that I have achieved, then you have to be able to weather the storm, to be able to have and have not. I've been rich and poor and rich and poor so many times, I can't tell the difference anymore. But one thing that I strive for is to be happy through it all. If I can, if I can find happiness, that is my, my power, my energy cell. So I... I relive that, you know, and I, and I hold every single moment in my life that has touched me deeply and I hold them in my heart. I don't care what it was, whether it be having my first kiss from a girl, and her name was Gloria, by the way, but Gloria. And, 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 and I, I kissed Gloria, and I never kissed anybody like that in my life. And I still, to this day, and I've had lots of girlfriends and been married twice, and nobody has kissed me like Gloria. Cause, and I felt that at 11 years old, and I, I'll never feel the same again. But I have it in my heart. I have it in my heart. So when I want to feel that power of that, I put on, I put on a record, or I smell the perfume, or I rub a coat, or some texture, and she, come right, she comes right back to me. And, that, and there's other experiences like that, where I've been hurt and disappointed. You know, and those disappointments, I hold on to them. I don't hold on to them because I... I, I, I I want to, uh, uh, you know, hate that person. I said, you know, you made me feel a certain way. I want to be able to use that someday. And so when you, when they broke my heart, or my my father broke my heart, or he disappointed me, or whatever. Then I say, you know, I I can like a playlist. I said, oh, this is the breaking heart moment. Mm, I just go right there. That's, that's that's all I do. I don't know how to explain it to anybody, but that way. Well, breakdancing has been given the green light and will be included in the 2024 Olympics. It's one of four new sports featured in the Games as the IOC shift their focus to the younger generation. When I heard the announcement 
from uh, the Olympics uh, announcing that a break-in is going to be included in the Olympic. On one hand, I was like, oh my God, break-in is going to be in the Olympic. <laughs> then the other hand was like, oh my God, break-in is going to be in the Olympic. <laughs> and so it gave way to this like real seriousness. I thought, well, you know, how is that going to work? Uh, because our pain is our flavor, isn't it? The pain that we hold in these inner cities across America, I'm talking about the haves and haves nots, and it's mostly blacks and Latinos, but that's not just true for us, it's also true for some white people too, who don't have money, or, or Asian people who don't have money. You know, poverty doesn't care who, it's, who it hurts, it will hurt everyone. Just like this pandemic doesn't, it doesn't care who you are, where you come from. So. In that, in, that, in that moment, I was like, okay, what's going to happen with our people? When I say our people, I'm talking about the people within the culture, which, which ranges from all kinds of colors. You know, you see someone like Simone Biles. She's a wonderfully gifted athlete. Beautiful. But she has hundreds of people behind her. Nutritionists, publicists, coaches, all kinds of things. Her support system is deep, and that may not have been true in the very beginning either. But we need to get there. There's no infrastructure in place. Most people in the world think break-in is a variety of dancing. They think that it's popping and locking and b-boying and so forth. They don't even really know the word b-boying, and the b-boys themselves, especially the ones that I'm friends with in New York, have, have fought for decades now trying to beat down the breaking name uh, they, they don't call themselves breakers or breaking or break dance. Those are, that's a commercial name that was created by the media and by my film. <laughs> so, but, the, but the movie Breaking, again, started this vernacular or at least perpetuated this vernacular because in Breaking, you saw many different styles of dancing in it, popping, locking, boogalooing, and so forth. So uh, don't be surprised if you see some of a sampling of many different styles, but the bulk of it be b-boying or some of those power moves, if you will, uh, which which is highly gymnastics, acrobatics, that kind of stuff. Um, but I think it's, I, overall, I still think it's a wonderful opportunity. I want to embrace it. I have embraced it. Uh, the IOC, I, I take my hat off to you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for bringing to life something that I have worked my entire life promoting and, 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 and doing whatever I could to uh, have it be respected on a global level. Now, we got a lot of fame from the movie Breaking. It made a lot of money. It did all of that stuff. But you, IOC, what you've done is something quite amazing. And I take my hat off to you for doing that. And uh, uh, anything that I could do to help you, uh, please, you know my number. Uh, you can reach me at, at anywhere. Just you know what? You probably just walk out on the street and say, hey, how, how do I find Shabadoo? And you'll find me. Hi, my name is Shabadoo, and you've just been buzzed. <laughs>